Hi, John McRoy here talking all things automotive. Today I'm talking about this new kind of electric motor. Very interesting. I've got Rory Brogan here. He is the founder and CEO of a company called Torev. And, you know, Rory, I think most people would look at your electric motor and say, oh, that's a pancake motor. You guys call it a double axial flux motor. What the hell does that mean? Yeah, explain <laughs> it. Yeah, yeah. Well, they, they'd be correct, actually. And in saying it's a pancake motor, that's the, the world of axial flux gets gets called out a lot. And of course, from the from the way you look, if you pull these one pulled one of these out of the vehicle, you'd see it looks basically like a pancake. Um, but the the real difference between what we're creating and, and the traditional style of, of pancake motor is that usually within a axial motor, you have a lot of permanent magnets that relates into a lot of rare earth metal, a lot of supply chain problems, right? We're, we're all very familiar with, with the supply chain challenges posed by those right now. Uh, but what we've really done is found a way to maximize the actual conductor volume of the motor to be able to get more uh, field coming from the stator of the motor as opposed to the reliance on the magnets. And so we can achieve some really great performance, but do so in a much more friendly way to your supply chains um, and, and save costs and even better still get to have the, the great efficiency and torque and all that uh, size advantage that comes from these pancake motors in the first place. What's the advantage of pancake motor? You know, they're, they're flat, obviously, as opposed to the yep. more traditional kind of electric motor that everyone's familiar with. Mm -hmm. what, what's it about these uh, uh, axial flux motors that make them good? Yeah, it, it's really down to the almost the shape of the magnetic field in the motor. Um, you get the magnets and the coils so so close to each other, and there's a, a much larger surface area that they have to interact across. And what that does is creates a a very high efficiency interaction. Your your magnetic field interactions are just stronger than they are in a traditional electric motor, and this leads to motors that can give higher power in a smaller packaging. Uh, but then when you look at how the the layout of the magnets and how they interplay with the the coil fields, you end up with a higher torque motor in the process. And so when you're looking at something like a electric vehicle or it's not just vehicles anymore, it's it's industrial vehicles all the way down to like scooters and stuff like that. Um, you end up with a much higher torque motor that allows you to actually make the transition away from things like gearboxes, uh, integrate and streamline the drivetrain components of the vehicle, um, and just realize a lot of not only performance advantages, but cost and weight savings and all that, all that good stuff that goes into making an EV go further. Yeah, so to talk about uh, mass and size, you know, yeah. you know, apples to apples, what do you offer? Yeah, yeah, well, if you're, if you're looking at kind of a, a traditional electric motor, right? Like the, the ID3 comes up all the time uh, when we're looking at just a, a kind of standard motor for comparison. Um, and this, this is true for, for many axial flux motors, similar for us. You, you get about a third of the size of the motor for the same amount of power um, and more torque in the process. And so, and of course, lower speeds in the process, but when you're looking at, at how your vehicle is moving down the road, your, your wheels aren't spinning it. 20,000 rotations a minute. Um, and so you end up with the ability to, again, just save that size. Um, and even better, you can stack these things together. And so for the same packaging, you might end up with two or three more times power um, than your traditional motor. Kind of like adding space. cylinders into, uh, you know, a traditional internal yeah, combustion. Very engine. similar, very similar, yeah. Very, and uh, how about mass, weight wise, how do you compare? Yeah, I mean, the the best motors out there right now are putting out 150, if not toward 200 plus kilowatts of power. Just, just to put in perspective here, 150 kilowatts is 200 horsepower. And you're putting that out in oftentimes packages weighing all of about 30 to 40 kilograms, maybe. Um, and so it's a very high power dense device. You have something that's the size of a dinner plate, almost putting out as much power as a V8 engine. Um, it's a it's a remarkable device. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> if if I'm a, a a packaging expert, you know, I would love to have something that small going in my car. Yeah. Uh, cost. You mentioned cost. Can can you give us some sort of ballpark area uh, comparison yeah. where you stand? 
Yeah. So when you're looking at axial flux, this is actually one of the challenges that have existed for, for legacy motors that we're really working on solving is how can we bring the cost of, of these motors down? You look at current deployments of axial flux motors and it's things like the Mercedes AMG, um, Ferrari, Koenigsegg, ultra, ultra high performance vehicles that have these things. And there's a lot of discussion right now into, into how do we bring the benefits of these motors? How do we bring that performance really to the masses? And folks like GM are releasing patents even just a couple of weeks ago, looking at, at axial flux motors and trying to kind of solve that problem. Um, but we've really got kind of this intuitive take. So if you're if you're really looking at um, from a pure cost perspective, um, especially compared to a, a axial flux traditional motor, we're saving oftentimes 20, 25 percent on that motor for the cost. And that's kind of at the baseline We're we're really focused on getting to the point where you can have an axial flux motor selling for as much as your standard radial flux motor that are going into to so many of these vehicles on the road today. Yeah, that's <laughs> you, you, you got a pretty good sales pitch there. What's been the reaction to uh, automakers? Anybody knocking on your door there? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah no, we've we've I mean, it's a veritable who's who right now. Uh, it's, it's folks out of the US, out of the EU, um, Japan. Um, China even, of, of course, reaching out, looking for new technologies here. Um, but I mean, we following our, our win at Gamic, I mean, it's conversations with tier ones, with the, the OEMs themselves. Um, it, it's really been remarkable because you hear about the auto world of being this impossible thing to, to break into. And I, I won't name the name, but for example, we had one of the most renowned automakers on the planet their their innovation team come and find us at a, a recent mobility expo and tap me on the shoulder and say hey we got to sit down we got to talk we love what you guys are doing and so it's this it's really exciting to be able to say that we've got something that you can put into a into a vehicle and not only make that vehicle perform better but to do so at a much more sustainable point for the environment it's it's really solving this this kind of double challenge of everyone wants to have something that's better, but how do you really make the the performance point? And, and we're very fortunate to to get to make that point. So where are you in this uh, point of time? Are you you're still developing it? You got a path to production or what? Yeah, so we're right now in the process of kind of putting the fishing touches on what's going to be our future flagship product, which is a 150 kilowatt, 200 horsepower equivalent um, electric motor um really again targeting that that electric vehicle space um right now we're in the we're actually kind of celebrating still a little bit the successful oversubscribed close of a recent fundraising round um so we're sitting on some some fresh capital which is always nice um but right now we're in the process of building up relationships building up those supply chain partnerships um we're certainly open to to folks if they want to reach out especially like like tier one suppliers, tier two suppliers who are looking to expand offerings. We're always looking for opportunities to collaborate. We're a startup. One of the, one of the great things about being a startup is we get to be very flexible in who we work with and when we work with them. Um, but right now it's, it's getting our supply chains really kind of formalized. We've got some wonderful folks that are already stepping up and saying, we want to be that, um, bringing on additional designers to the team. Um, folks who are just phenomenally talented in, in auto drives are, are supporting the, the development of this technology. And we expect her in the next 12 months, we're going to have something that is really, really special to get to unveil. And, and always I'll, I'll give the shameless pitch here. Um, we're a startup. We only get capacity to work with so many people. So if you're, if you, if someone sounds like they're interested in this, that's a, maybe a good motivator to, to yeah. out on that. My, my shameless shout out. Better get in line right now. <laughs> exactly, uh, exactly. So what, what's your plan? Are you thinking maybe you would take this to production yourself, Torov would make motors, or are you going to license it? We're exploring a little bit of both options, honestly. And we've got very strong interest in both options. But right now, we're really focused on developing the technology and making something that is just such a high-performance, remarkable product. Um and then we're kind of solving the final challenge of is it a licensing play, is it a, a full purchase play, kind of when we get there. Um, certainly we're, we're open to either discussion, but uh, again, right now we're, we're so early in the 
the startup stage, uh, we get flexibility in, in who we work with, where we work with them. And certainly some geographies might be better for us to look at licensing. Some might be better for us to look at producing. Um, long story short, we'll, we'll know a lot more here in about 12 months. Okay. Where'd you even get the idea to do this? Yeah, it's a passion project. Um, so I started, I'm an electrical engineer, mathematician, at least by education. Um, I've always been fascinated with the world of motors, with the world of electromagnetics really specifically. And so when back in 2016, when I very first started researching um, electric motors, the next generation cutting edge kind of technology that was out, of course, was Tesla that was all over the news. They were having a big bull market run in the stock market and the news of electrification and is this the future and is, is this going to be what we're driving someday was just all over the place. Every headline you looked at, top top page of the news was was electrification, new products being released, new innovation. Um, and honestly, just is a passion project, kind of unsponsored research project. Honestly, I just started looking at the world of motors and really trying to find if there was anything that hadn't yet been done in the in the world of motors. I had no idea, no idea at all where this was all going to go or if there was anything even still available, right? Um, a lot of very, very smart people have been working on this for a very long time to get us to where we are. Um, kind of stumbled into the world of, of pancake motors. I've actually got this, this little red notebook. Um, I call it my inventor's log. Cocky engineer that I was. I, I woke up one day and had the idea. It's like, I managed to solve this. I figured out a way to, to get the magnetic fields the way I want them to work. And I, I wrote down this sketch for, for what I thought was the world's very first axial flux motor. Um, realized I was beaten to this by Michael Faraday back in like the mid 1800s. <laughs> it was a nice <laughs> kick to my ego on that one. Um, actually, uh, kind of a fun fact is, is these are some of the first motors that were ever made were, were axial flux, which is, is kind of just a cool historic fact. Um, but after having that, that realization of, okay, well, I was, I was beaten by one notable inventor a long time ago. Um, it didn't quite stop me. And I think I was very fortunate in the, the direction of research that I had taken um, in that I was able to, within the course over kind of a year, but identify this unique interaction um, that is really kind of the core IP that, that allows our technology to work today. Um, and so a very long process, I, I kind of did <laughs> everything I could to get as close to, to learning about the world of, of startups and technology. I, I did a, a stint in the business world and venture capital. Um, I can safely say that there is nothing that prepares you for the founder's journey just in general. Um, but over the course of a lot of trial and error, a lot of, a lot of effort, um, and kind of laying the groundwork and figuring out, well, we've got this device. What's really special about it? Who really cares about it? Um, and finally, after, I mean, years, year, years worth of work, um, made the decision back in May of 2022 uh, that I was going to launch this thing full time and dove right in. And it took me about a year to really figure out who we are and get my feet under me. Um, but of course, now, if you if you look at our track record this year, I mean, it's it's a remarkable showing for for a a very very new technology and in a market that again is so established and has for so long been considered this impossible thing to break into yeah that's right no look th this is why the industry needs uh innovators and entrepreneurs like yourself and you know earlier you you mentioned gamic you know the the global automotive mobility innovation challenge that's how i even learned about torev is you know you were selected by a panel of automotive experts as having one of the best new technologies this year that they've seen. How, how has that uh, helped your company? Oh my gosh, that, that did, that event alone did a year's worth of business development and all of about an hour. It was a, I mean, it's still a night and day difference. It's the, we, the, the company pre gamic and post gamic are such remarkable different things in part, in large part because of the mentorship we've gotten, the guidance that we've gotten just the resources and the connections that have opened up to us because of it. Um, and, and it's not just one, one panel of automotive experts. I think that's, that's one of the things that makes the win so special to us is this is at least three different pitches, three different panels, all automotive industry executives sitting down and looking at your technology and probing your team and your business model and, 
all of this stuff and ultimately making the decision of, okay, yeah, you're one of the top four out of 1500 um, technologies they got to look at. Um, so it's been this remarkable acceleration. It's led into wins at like federal competitions with the Department of Energy for funding. It's what it's led to invitations from very well regarded VCs with deep ties to the mobility world, giving us a personal invitation to come and to pitch to all of their innovation teams and to have one on one conversations with them. Um, it has it's really been something special for for what we've been building. You know, another thing about uh, Torev and you uh, is you're based in Arlington, Virginia. You know, yeah. yeah, usually when I'm talking to, you know, really innovative stuff, it's Silicon Valley or, you know, other tech hubs. Uh, but that doesn't seem to have stopped you one iota. Nope. Nope. Uh, we're, um, I like to say that good ideas will find their home wherever they may be. Um, I was, I did my stint in venture capital and in, in the, in the nation's capital. Um, and I got to see all of these cool technologies and kind of the idea that I, that I kind of grew up in the entrepreneurship world with was you can make a great technology, you can great, make a great business anywhere. And the state of Virginia has been really quite wonderful to us. Um, you don't think about like the, the DC, Northern Virginia area is a real tech hub, but they have some phenomenal resources. Whether totally that, agree. No, no. Yeah. I mean, it, 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 look, anybody who's into any information technology, cyber technology, communications technology, no, that's a real hotbed, but it's not necessarily one for electric motors. <laughs> no, no, and we've, we've had to kind of build our own ecosystem out here, but there's, I heard it described, I was, I was visiting, um, this was in South Carolina, I heard it described as this, that the, the former uh, Bible Belt is almost rebranding to the Battery Belt now. <laughs> and so you see uh, states like Virginia, like, like the Carolinas, um, all the way down into like, Georgia, Alabama, Mississippi, um, all starting to really look at leveraging their existing workforce moving toward electrification. And so we get to be really right on the right on the forefront of all this, especially working within the state. And um, we're one of the early success stories, certainly of a, a hard tech company, um, really making something that is is tangible and and you can pull it apart poke at it, prod at it. Um, they have done a remarkable job of setting aside resources and finding folks that we can be in touch with. And we're certainly aided by the local ecosystem, having other folks that are doing like electric vehicle retrofit, um, having, of course, the incentives based in Arlington, Virginia, right across the river to the tune of hundreds of billions of dollars have been set aside to support um, electrification efforts. It's not somewhere you would think as the normal spot to set something like this up, but we've had a shortcut almost into a bunch of resources that a lot of startups, I think, take a lot more time than us to, to figure out and to get to leverage. Mm -hmm. Well, look, uh, I can't wait to see, you know, one of these motors in operation. You're saying about a year from now, you're going to have something really to present, eh? Yeah, yeah, about a year. And worth noting, we've already created the world's first prototype of this. So, yeah, cool. Yeah. So let's talk again in a year, because <laughs> I, I think you're really on to something. And I, I say that because I know most of the gamut judges. And I mean, these people really know what they're doing. So when they yeah. selected you as one of the finalists, I knew that you were really on to something. Oh, I, I appreciate that. No, we've been, it has been a very exciting journey that we've got to be on. We're, we're always grateful to, to all of the folks that went into Gamic. Of course, it's it's the judges, it's the other participants, everyone who helped to step up and support this event. I mean, for any other mobility startups that may be out there, it's a it's, a, it's almost a well-kept secret. I don't know, remember how exactly we learned about it, but it has made a huge difference for us. Yeah, I, I, I would highly recommend any startup uh, ha has not heard of GAMIC, G-A-M-I-C, that they do so. And uh, you're absolutely right. It's uh, uh, It's been a, a, a secret. Now we're, we're helping to make uh, it uh, far better known. Well, we're gonna do our part to help that out, no doubt. Okay. Thanks so much. Absolutely. John, I appreciate it. Thank you for having me on.